Thank you for having me. Thanks uh, uh, for coming, everyone. Um, it's my first time in Poland, and it's a really lovely place. Uh, I love it here so far, and uh, hopefully come back again soon. Um, in all the teams I've built, I've always had uh, Polish devs, and uh, it's always a pleasure to work with uh, Polish devs. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, UX direction in AAA games. Um, and uh, specifically about this concept of presence that uh, I will mention, and I will uh, explain all about it. So uh, first, quickly about me. So I'm Ahmed, I'm a, a content director at Ubisoft's uh, global creative office now. Before that, I was a UX director in at Ubisoft Stockholm, working on uh, uh, some unannounced IP. Uh, I've been working on interfaces in general for almost 20 years now. Uh, started making uh, interfaces for uh, Windows apps, uh, applications for Windows. Uh, moved into uh, uh, coding and designing mobile apps uh, back in uh, 2010, approximately. Um, and then joined uh, the AAA game industry by uh, when I joined Sony back in... Uh, 2013, right before the PS4 launched. And uh, now I'm at Ubisoft uh, for the past three years or so. You can see here some of the games that I've worked on. Uh, Killzone Shadowfall was a launch title on PS4, uh, which was a very uh, difficult project. Uh, so I don't recommend doing launch titles. It's, <laughs> it's like uh, building a, a, a game while the console is still being built. It's like uh, racing a car uh, that is still being built uh, before you race it. And uh, uh, worked on Horizon Zero Dawn and Forbidden West. Then I moved to uh, Sweden to work on Battlefield and uh, uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2 and uh, Battlefield 2042 and uh, now at Ubisoft. So uh, in our uh, industry, uh, usually the UX direction comes second. So we uh, we have amazing creative directors and game directors that come up with amazing game concepts and they uh, um, uh, develop those. And then uh, usually we come after and try to apply a UX direction on, on top of that. Um, we uh, The UX craft within games is, is uh, pretty young. Not uh, if you compare it, uh, a lot younger if you compare it to industries like mobile and internet or the web. And uh, uh, so usually they paint the picture and we have to color it in from a UX perspective. And uh, this is a, a, um, a big challenge that, has, that I've seen uh, across my career. And in the past seven years or so, I've been working really hard to try to uh, find the overlap and, and make this a smoother thing. Not have one be the a response to the other, but find uh, a way to set out a common direction for the game and the user experience. And that's kind of what this talk is going to be about. It's going to be hopefully about that middle bit. Uh, and it's going to be a way to unify uh, game designers and interface designers to come up with a, a singular vision. So uh, as you've seen in the title of my talk, uh, I called it presence in practice. And so we start with, let's start by uh, defining what presence is. And presence, this is a term uh, coined in from psychology. It was coined by Marvin Minsky, who was the founder of the MIT uh, uh, Artificial Intelligence Lab. And uh, he found he coined this uh, term back in 1980. And uh, broadly, what he uh, uh, described it as is it's a state or a perception where a part of, of a person's experience is filtered through uh, technology. So a, a way to think about this is if you're uh, on the phone, and not, not a lot of us uh, uh, go on phone calls anymore these days, but if you're on the phone, and you close your eyes, you can imagine so yourself in a dark room uh, speaking to somebody uh, in that room because you can hear them and uh, you can't see them. And uh, uh, that feeling that you get, 
like being in a dark room with somebody that's uh, that phenomenon or the feeling of presence so uh, the technology in that case is the phone um, and what's filtered through it is uh, uh, um, information or, or it's a person's voice but there are other situations that I can mention for instance if you're flying a drone you know if you if you fly a drone for a very long time you can start feeling that you're uh, flying through the air. That's also a similar feeling. And even um, things like toy grabbing machines. There's one outside here at the Intel booth. If you have infinite time and you have um, uh, infinite coins, at some point the, the arm of the, the machine will start feeling like an extension of yourself. So this is also... Uh, very applicable to uh, robotics. And actually, the, the Intel booth outside here uses hand tracking to do it. So it's very uh, interesting if you go out and uh, play with that. You can uh, get to experience this uh, yourself. So I'm not an expert in psychology or in this uh, uh, topic, presence, but I will talk a bit on how I use this to uh, find that common ground between game design that creates uh, or, or world design and uh, interface design. Um, and if you want to read about the topic, I, I invite you to go online and, and uh, search for it. There's a lot of very uh, extensive white papers that cover this topic. You can find them. Uh, they're free to read. And uh, uh, I invite you to go uh, uh, do some research yourselves. Um, so what do psychologists study when they study presence? Uh, if you map out the human experience on a bar like this one, and on one end you have real experiences, so things you feel like uh, pinching yourself or punching yourself, <laughs> that's a real experience you feel. And on the other end you have a hallucination, which is an experience that you that is not real, like a dream. A dream can be considered uh, a form of hallucination. What people that study presence study are uh, virtual experiences, which are kind of the, the gray between both ex extremes. So uh, when you read about this topic, uh, keep that in mind. It's, it's a bunch of very smart people that try to find the, the, the middle ground between reality and hallucination. And so how can this help us uh, um, uh, in games? So, of course, when we're playing games, we experience, uh, we, our games all take part in this virtual bit. It's kind of in the middle. Um, and uh, our features that we make for our games or the systems that we build in our games can all affect this feeling of presence. So... You can imagine that some things will be in affinity with this feeling and some will uh, contrast it. And what I've done here is I've taken the liberty to write down some features that you might have uh, heard or things or, or um, things that we have in our games that might be in affinity with it. So things like uh, supporting RTX or making your visuals more realistic, they support this feeling. And things like uh, uh, force feedback and uh, VR or uh, even things like inverse kinematics and uh, uh, features like that all uh, help this feeling. They uh, help our players stay in this feeling of presence. Oh, I skipped one. <laughs> Um, we also have things that are um, in contrast with it. Wait, 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 wait. Going back too fast. We have things that are in contrast with it. And I've taken the liberty to write some of those down here. So you have things, of course, that could be considered bugs, like clipping through walls or seeing back faces of, uh, of uh, polygons, like was mentioned in the talk before all these things they pull you out of this feeling of presence so um uh, things like uh, uh difficulty spikes or even foot sliding all those things that jar against this feeling of presence uh 
can be co said to contrast with it. And the reason why I didn't say good for or bad against, or I didn't call them good or bad, is because, of course, whether we uh, use these uh, two types of things, that they could be unintentional, like some of the things you see here, things like uh, uh, foot sliding, that could be a bug, um, and uh, that could be unintentional. But there's also things that are intentional, like having full screen overlays over your game that will contrast uh, as well. But the because they can be uh, intentional, I, I try to find terms that allow us to use both as tools. So we can come up with things that are in affinity with this feeling, but also things that contrast. So for instance, if you're trying to explain something crucial to a player, that, that something that they need to know to play our game, maybe it makes sense to have a full screen overlay because you want to contrast, you want to pull them out of this uh, feeling to be able to teach them something. So that's why I use these words. Um, so we have the affinity, we have the contrast. Uh, next, what I want to do is I want to talk a bit about the types of UI we use in 3D games. And uh, some of you might know all of this already, so bear with me. For completion's sake, I will just go over them and show some examples. And then we will uh, uh, talk about the presence and, and see how that uh, fits in. So. Um, the types of UI, these were, um, I got these from a thesis that was written over in Stockholm. It was written by these two uh, uh, students. They were working at DICE uh, back in 2009. This is way before I joined DICE, so I never uh, uh, met, met them. But they wrote a thesis called uh, Beyond the HUD, and this is where I uh, uh, got these UI types from. So. Again, I invite you to uh, download their thesis. It's it's free to get online and have a read for of it. It's a very uh, fascinating uh, uh, topic. So what they said in their thesis is there are two types of uh, variables uh, that you can use to create a model which covers four types of UI. And that model is, you can see here, and you can see um, uh, there are UIs that are either based in the narrative of the game or not, of the game world, and uh, types that are either projected in 3D space in the world or not, or in 2D on the viewport. And some of these words you might already have seen, and I will quickly show examples of, uh, from uh, all of these sections, so, you can, so we all kind of uh, have the same understanding. So you have diegetic interfaces. These are uh, world famous. All uh, game designers want to have everything diegetic and that's, uh, it's great, uh, but it's only one of the tools that we use in games. And here are some examples. Um, so a very famous one is Dead Space. You see it on the top left there where uh, the, the weapon or the weapon count, ammo count is displayed uh, near, the pist the, near the gun that he uses. And what you can see there is that this interface, the ammo count, the player character or the character that you control can see it. So it's in the narrative of the game, but also projected in 3D space. Same goes with uh, uh, the, the motion detector over in Alien Isolation. That's a first person game. But you can imagine it that the character that you're controlling can see this interface, which means it's in the narrative and in the world. Next, we have meta interfaces. So these are ones that are still in the narrative, but are projected in 2D on the viewport. And you can see here some examples. Things like the blood spatters that you see in Call of Duty around the, the, the screen when uh, you're low on health. You know, uh, a soldier does not see blood in their eyes <laughs> when they're hurt. So uh, this is uh, a 2D uh, effect but it's uh, representative of something uh, grounded in the narrative of the game. And uh, same goes with uh, lockpicks and uh, uh, books that are uh, projected in 2D. Here, they are actually, a, this is a 3D book, but it's a 2D project projection. So it's uh, 2D in front of the camera and there's no hands holding it. 
So in that case, it's a meta interface. Uh, next, I will talk about spatial. So this is these are going to be UIs or interfaces that are not based in the narrative, but are projected in the world. And you can see some examples here. So for instance, uh, uh, this shader that you see around uh, sound in, uh, in The Last of Us, things that Joel can hear. This is a, a, a spatial effect. You see it in the world and it represents something that he that the character hears but it is not uh, 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 based in the in the narrative so it's just a, a an effect for the player not for the uh, character uh, similarly you have a health bar in a game like assassin's creed that is projected over the head of a character you know you can uh, uh, the the player character does not see it only the player and finally, we have abstract interfaces, and those are not based in the narrative and uh, projected in 2D, and those are all the interfaces we've come to love. And here are some examples from uh, Battlefield and uh, Destiny. So now that we've talked about these UI types, you know, uh, how do they affect this feeling of presence that we uh, talked about before? And what I've done here is I've taken the liberty to make a, a cheat sheet. Um, so what I've done here is I've put the affinity all the way in the top and contrast in the bottom. And you can see that, of course, things that are diegetic, that are placed in the world that the character sees, they, are, uh, they contrast the least or they are most in affinity with this feeling. And as you go down in narrative, so go to meta and then spatial and down to abstract, the contrast uh, gets uh, more and more. And I, I've taken the liberty to do this. And what I've done as well is, is try to tie it to uh, the, the loops that the game designers work on. So a lot of game designers, they will talk about the second to second or the core toy of a game. And they will talk about the minute to minute exp experience and maybe the hour to hour, you know? And what I try to do is use the language that we use in UI and compare it with the language that, we, that they use in their uh, designs to try to find a common language. And uh, so this, this is a cheat sheet that you can use with your teams to, to workshop this. And uh, so how do you, uh, and, and, and of course the, the goal here is not to, use one or the other. I, in my personal opinion, these are all tools we can use. Of course, there will be people that will push for one over the other, but this is a very good way to workshop your game or look at your game holistically in a way that makes it about the product and not about what people uh, want to achieve. So a good way to workshop this is to, of course, grab something like a feature map or a master feature list and create a big workshop with your uh, uh, teams where you get uh, game designers and uh, UI uh, designers involved. And you know, if you have a, a, a chart like this where you have epics and features and sub features, you can uh, sit down and create post-its and start marking them up and seeing which features belong in which uh, buckets. And of course, people will have different opinions about this. There are features that could live in multiple buckets, but this is a, a workshop I've held with many teams and it's a very effective way to uh, make both game designers and UX designers speak the same language. So once you've done this, you can of course take all of your features and create a big artifact like this, put all the features that are diegetic, put them in the top and meta in the, down and all the way to your abstract features. And then you can put this on the wall together and look at it and, and uh, reason about it, but also maybe optimize it. And uh, a great thing you can do with this as well is send off the meta and the diegetic features to your narrative team so that they can really preempt and, and take these features and base them in the narrative properly. Um, so that's uh, very helpful for IP building and uh, narrative design as well. 
And another thing you can do is when you get new features, which we inevitably all get, it's a very good way to reason about that feature together and know the scope before uh, you start building it. So uh, this is a, a the, what you see here is what I would call an artifact. And the, 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 the best thing about these artifacts is you can create them together with your team and make the discussion about your game holistically, not about people's opinions. So I'm, what I'm gonna do next is uh, uh, talk a bit about um, a case, a case study of a, of a game that you might all know. And I, we're gonna apply this uh, uh, same method to analyze uh, a game. So, we're going to talk about Ghost of Tsushima. Who here has played it? Have people played this game? It's an a excellent open world uh, uh, samurai game. And you play as a, a samurai called Jin Sakai. And uh, um, they have a very intuitive feature called the guiding wind. And that's what I, the one I want to talk about. So traditionally in open world adventure games, uh, navigation is done through location markers, a compass, and a map. And this is a very common uh, pattern that people see in uh, open world games. So you can see a location marker can be spatial, it can be uh, projected uh, in the, on the viewport to mark a 3D point. A compass is kind of both, it shows a direction and is 2D. And then you have maps that are traditionally just 2D. And they look something like this. So here you have a compass and a marker. These are very common navigation tools in 3D games. What uh, Ghost of Tsushima did very good was they uh, introduced a feature called Guiding Wind, which is a diegetic um, compass of sorts that shows you where to go in the world. And they based that in the narrative. So, so in the game, they explain it as a... Uh, the soul of your dead father that shows you the way you have to go. And when you uh, uh, follow that, when you get closer to your objective within 50 meters, only then do they show your location marker. And of course, you still have your map to use for navigation. And that looks something like this. So here you see uh, the wind guiding uh, your character to where they have to go. And you can see here, uh, all the foliage and all the horse, the horse's mane flows in the direction of the wind. So it's a very intuitive way to uh, follow your direction without contrasting with that feeling of presence, keeping you in the world, keeping you in the narrative. And then when you get closer, only then do they show your marker. So only within 50, 50 meters of your objective do they start showing you the marker. And of course that is necessary because otherwise the players will be uh, searching with their camera. So the marker is kind of only in the end when the people want to really see where the uh, objective is that they're uh, following. So here you can see uh, uh, an example of a, of a game uh, with these artifacts, specifically in navigation. Of course, I, I don't think that the, the team worked this way, but it's a very good way to show the, the power of using something like this on your own games. You can make this artifact reason about uh, features and where they belong. Do the, are they closer to the second to second? Promote them. Are they uh, further away from it? Maybe demote them. Another uh, case study that I have that is also interesting is a game called Shadow Gambit. Uh, this is a strategic uh, uh, game where you play a, a crew of ghost pirates and um, it's kind of a stealth strategy game like the old games uh, uh, like Commandos and Desperados and those kind of games. And they have a feature called Capture Memories, which also uh, really maps out well on this. So uh, uh, in games that are strategic, people usually make decisions and sometimes regret making those decisions because you have to think ahead and plan and sometimes you fail. So what do people uh, usually do then is they use 
features like quick save and load and there's a lot of people from Baldur's Gate uh, uh, speaking here this uh, this week and it's uh, they've made an amazing game that is very strategic and I love it and uh, often what people do when they play Baldur's Gate they save before they make a decision you know so you have these situations where you have to do a skill roll or a, or a wisdom check so what do you do Instead of failing, you quickly save your game, go to your uh, abstract UI, save the game or do a quick save, and then uh, load so that you can always get your critical success. And this is a, a save scumming is a thing that happens in all uh, strategy games. People always do that. Um, so what have uh, Shadow Gambit done? They've taken something like save scumming, which is a very common thing people do, and they've put it into the meta of the game, the meta design of the game. So what they've done is in their story, they have uh, the, the crew of pirates has a boat and this boat can capture memories and into pearls and then reload them for you. So I have a video here that I'll play. It doesn't have any sound. So here you can see a, a player capturing a memory before they go in and try to kill an NPC. So if they do it and then fail, they can select a memory and crack it open to reload uh, the situation. And this is a way to uh, capture something that the players always do, which is quick save and quick load in order to prevent making the wrong decisions into the narrative and making it an, a meta interface. So uh, lastly, uh, what, what I'll do before uh, we wrap up is I'll um, show using a, a kind of a, a, a fictional game that I've quickly made, uh, uh, how you would do this from scratch. So imagine we're making a game called UbiBot. That's because I work for Ubisoft. <laughs> uh, not very creative there. And here's a model that I uh, stole from uh, TurboSquid. Um, and imagine this is an open world uh, adventure game. Uh, you can take all the systems or the high level features that a game like that will have. It will have a health system, a low health warning, a shield, a loot system, a skill tree, and also an incoming threat assist detection system. And that's necessary in all games that have that are 3D because you can get attacked from off camera. So we can take this feature list and using the workshop uh, determine where they fit. So take all the systems that are close to the second to second, put them in diegetic. I've done it here for you already. So, um, And then uh, uh, take the other systems and uh, scatter them over this uh, model. And of course, create your artifact. And then you can take these top ones and ground them in your narrative. And that would look something like this. So I've, I've uh, quickly made some renders with uh, um, in, a th in 3D software. So here's your robot. You can take the health system and put it on these batteries on his back. You can take a shield and put it on the shields on his back. And of course, that's all based in the narrative and you see it in, in space. And of course, take uh, something like an incoming thread and, uh, and uh, attach it to their antenna. So, so you can take all the second to second features, put them diegetic. Low health warning, that's more of a every encounter you have, it happens once if you're not good player. And uh, what, I, what I've done here is I've just stolen it from Call of Duty, taken something uh, and made it meta. So this is supposed to be a representation maybe of what a robot sees when they uh, get hurt. You can take something like a loot system and make it spatial. So make it uh, contextual on the things that you loot. A lot of games do this already. And then finally, you can take things like a skill tree that you see maybe every 20 minutes when you're playing, when you level up and have that be abstract. So what you've done, what we've done here is take these features and paste them out 
So you don't see the abstract interfaces all the time and have it be deliberately kind of laid out over the gameplay loops. And of course, when you've done that, you can also do some validation. And here you can see um, using telemetry data or using even recordings of people playing, you can validate your hypothesis. And this is very important, of course, when you are um, uh, testing your games, you can uh, look back and test the theories that you've uh, come up with. So, yeah, that was uh, my talk. and. Um, I can uh, answer any questions you have about this. This is a, a, a process that I've used extensively with teams within Ubisoft and also outside. And if you have any questions, I can uh, answer them for you. And please also uh, go to this website and uh, give me some uh, feedback on it. I would love to hear from you. Thank you. We're, it's done pretty quick. Yeah, uh, the talk was amazing. Yeah. I actually, I'm not really that like focused on UI and UX yeah. and what you did was like, I'm just focused. It was really nice. So the talk was amazing. And the first thing that I had in mind uh, when I was listening is that um, I, like, I'm learning game design and I hear a lot about Im like immersion. And I'm thinking, what's the difference between immersion and presence? Is that the same thing or? Uh, so the difference between immersion and present, I, I don't see, uh, personally, I think the term immersion, I mean, it's, it's more about, I guess, uh, what the player feels when they're playing your game. And uh, so it can, it can be used interchangeably, but in this case, what I try to do is really look at, um, uh, what are the, the sides of that? So, so you could use a word like immersion too. Uh, I, I don't see that as a, a different definition or anything. But this is in in uh, psychology at least they call that presence. So when you're interacting with stuff uh, virtually, that feeling you get of immersion that's called presence in psychology. So I just use the term uh, when I when I try to uh, study about uh, about this and read about it, I was looking for immersion everywhere on the internet, and I would always go down uh, rabbit holes. and And when I uh, really found this term, that's when it unlocked for me. So that's why I use that. But, uh, so so yes, on the dev floor, you will hear people say things like immersion. If you want to study it, then it's better to uh, uh, read up on presence. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, there, there's somebody in the back. Uh, yes, so the question is, uh, do you think it's possible to make a game that only uses uh, diegetic UI and nothing uh, abstract? So the answer is yes, but that's kind of like uh, uh, cooking with only a spoon. So it's like, you, you can do that, of course, but it's going to be difficult if you don't have a knife. Uh, and uh, so, so that's kind of how I like to uh, look at it myself. All of these UI types that I showed are tools at your disposal. And some are good at things that others are not good at. So for instance, a diegetic interface, it's great for preserving this feeling of presence and keeping people in the world, but it also has things that are bad, which is... If, if uh, you have a diegetic uh, piece of information, it has to show usually on a predictable part of your screen. You have to be able to, to know where it's going to be. If it's traveling around your screen, it will become uh, a strain on your players. So even if you look at a game like uh, Dead Space, it's it, usually you see that ammo count when you aim down sights, which means that it's connected with the bone to your camera. So it's always in the same spot. Same goes with Alien Isolation, that example that I had. She always holds the motion detector in the same spot. So, you, so the player 
uh, knows where to expect it and it becomes usable. If you do everything uh, diegetically, then you would have to design your game in a way or, or it would help or, or to design the game in a way where all the information is always in a predictable place. So again, in a, in a case like a, a third person game, your character is always usually in the same spot under your reticule. So that will work. But then as soon as you start conveying large amounts of information and when you can't control where it is on the screen, then it falls. So, so that's kind of, uh, does that answer your question? So it depends on the, the type of uh, information you want to show. Same goes with the amount of information. If you have large texts, it's usually a hard diegetic because you deal with things like perspective. It becomes hard to read and hard to parse. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. Anyone else? Yeah, up there. Yes, so so the question is, can we measure it? No, <laughs> that's the that's the the difficult bit. So this is uh, a thesis, and that's why I showed that slide in the end, where you can you can you can test it, but you can't measure it. Um, uh, I mean, maybe there are ways to measure it with I don't know retinal scanning, blood pressure devices. I have no idea. I would l like to uh, uh, if if there is something like that, I would love to hear about it. But uh, um, you can, uh, yeah, no, it's it's more an intuitive thing. It's a thesis that you can test and you can design against and be intentional against, but it's uh, difficult to measure because, uh, yeah, you would have to measure people's uh, uh, perception, which is very hard. Like, uh, you can, of course, uh, uh, use uh, things like questionnaires and things that dig into that. That's how psychologists do it. So, Does that answer your question? It doesn't, but... <laughs> yes, so, so, so how do you know it's better than... There, there is no better. There's only the like like with every design i feel that we come up with a hypothesis and we develop uh solutions using these hypotheses to uh come up with the best possible solution so anyway you will have to test with players and make sure that it works but this is just a, a hypothesis that can be shared between ux designers and game designers because it has a common language uh, anyone else? Ah, there's somebody. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the lecture. It was amazing. Uh, I have a question. Do you think that any additional tools like that used in psychology, for example, eye tracking will help to measure players' behavior and uh, uh, make the UI better? Um, yeah, so yes, of course. Um, I mean, not really related to this, but I think eye tracking is great because it will, it c can, I guess with, with eye tracking and heat maps that you generate from eye tracking, you can see the areas where people focus most. And, and uh, I, you can, I guess, reason that if there are situations where the player needs to move their eye around a lot, to read uh, what they need to understand to play the game, that that might uh, have more contrast on this uh, 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 concept that I talk about. So there could be, you could reason that. Um, I think with eye tracking, you can definitely detect a bit when people are in the zone and, and where they look most. And personally, when I uh, do play tests or, or uh, in UXR labs, I mostly use it to to kind of reduce travel and make sure that people don't have to strain, and uh, spe specifically in in certain contexts. So what what I'll do is I'll take uh, I don't know a combat scenario, make people play combat, and then 
see if there's uh, places that are uh, far away in the heat map and try to reduce that. So, so yes, they, they are uh, used a lot, things like uh, eye tracking. And that's very common already. So in all of the UXR labs, we use it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's common. Yeah. So if you go to any UXR lab, Ubisoft has a, a bunch of really large ones. We have one in uh, Malmo, which is uh, very big. It services uh, all of Europe. And uh, in Malmo, we have uh, extensive eye tracking uh, uh, technology. So we uh, record all of that for sure. Uh, do you use any other tools? Uh, uh, well, we record, of course, we record everything. We record the face of people and we uh, record their uh, controller inputs mm -hmm. and record all the feeds. So, and we can recall all of that to uh, match it and see what the player were doing. It's that eye tracking, but also uh, questionnaires. So it's a lot of preparing the right questions and making sure that uh, we have unbiased kind of information from players. And what we also do is we uh, show the footage to the, uh, te uh, to the test subject after. So if there are situations where they um, maybe don't parse something well, what we'll do is we'll play the video again for them and pause it and then ask them questions about it okay. uh, live to see uh, what they notice. So those are kind of the tools uh, most people use. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Anyone else more? So I guess I was uh, super clear then. <laughs> super clear and super quick. So thank you. Thank you all for coming and uh, appreciate it. Uh, I will be, uh, I'll be around here today and tomorrow. So if you have any more questions or whatever, please just uh, grab me. I'll be uh, walking around. So thank you.